All right, everybody. I want to welcome you back to class. I hope everybody's doing okay. Got a lot to cover with you. I hope you enjoyed that movie. And I got something to say about that in a minute. Just want to bring us back to where we were uh, this semester, right, that we've been looking at uh, already, you know, as we're leading up to uh, our next exam, right, that we're going to, that we've looked at action potentials, right, we've seen a lot about uh, summation, and we've seen how uh, excitatory neurotransmitters uh, bring uh, neurons closer to threshold and make action potentials more likely. Right, and then we've seen how inhibitory neurotransmitters, on the other hand, right, they take uh, cells away from threshold and uh, they make an action potential less likely, right? And uh, so hopefully you guys are good there with excitatory inhibitory neurotransmitters and how that works with summation. And the more often it arrives, the greater its effect, temporal. And where it arrives matters, the closer it arrives to the axon hillock. Uh, the greater its effect. Then we've looked at saltatory and continuous conduction, and hopefully you guys are good with that now. And we've seen how saltatory conduction uh, with the myelination increases the speed of conduction because you only have to generate uh, action potentials at the nodes, and it's able to transmit electrically through the synapse, uh, through the spaces between the nodes, through the myelinated area, right? And that continuous conduction would be slower right, because you have to generate action potentials all the way along the node, um, and again, the thicker neuro neurons would have a, a, a faster rate of message, right, and that a thinner diameter, and we're talking about the diameter of the axon here, again, and that a thinner diameter uh, axon would have a slower rate of transmission. And then as you begin to add myelin, of course, it speeds up. And that gets us our speeds of anywhere from zero to 300 miles per hour. The neurons that are getting up to 300 miles per hour, those would be the neurons that would be uh, myelinated and thick, right? So they could do saltatory conduction and then they would be uh, thick. Right? We want those would be the thick ones. We've also done a look at the endocrine system and I wanted to make a quick review of that. Right, with the endocrine system, uh, we've taken a look at uh, lipophilic molecules and we saw how they uh, are different from the lipophobic and all hormones are either lipophilic or lipophobic and how they, we already know about signal transduction, so you guys should be clear that the lipophilics will go direct signal transduction and the lipophobics won't. And uh, we took a look at the definition of trophic, tropic or releasing or stimulating hormones, right? Those would be hormones that are having effect their effect is to cause the release of another hormone. They don't have a direct effect, but their effect is to cause the release of a hormone. Um, and that is their effect, right? And we saw some look at disease states um, where if something were to go wrong, where we have a hyper or a hypo secretion or a hyper or a hypo responsiveness in the nervous system, in the endocrine system. And hopefully today I'll give you an example again of uh, that in the endocrine system. And uh, also looking at the permissive effect, whereas some uh, messengers, they can only exert their full effect in the presence of another uh, messenger. And we use the example in lab uh, of the thyroid hormone. And then uh, hopefully you guys watch the video on the muscles before starting this. And that's the first thing I want to say. It's got a little disclaimer about the language in the movie. There's one thing that might be confusing. So... Here we go with the language. So a little bit of error in the language. It's not so much an error, it's sort of in the way we speak. Physiologists sometimes, just like we talk about, the cell has more positive charges on the outside and less on the inside, so we say the inside is negative. Well, we know the inside's not actually negative, it's just less positive than the outside. But they sometimes use that terminology with oxygen, and they'll say that there's an oxygen debt. And what they mean is, that there's more carbon dioxide levels compared to normal in the oxygen, and therefore the oxygen level is lower compared to the higher than normal CO2, and they'll describe that as an oxygen debt. But make no mistake about it, all right, we have, uh, we have uh, not run out of uh, oxygen, right? We're just saying that there's less oxygen than normal because of the fact that 
the CO2 levels are higher than normal. So the oxygen levels in relationship to the higher CO2, we can say it is the debt. But in reality, what's actually going on, I just want to explain it. And we'll do more of this when we do the respiratory system, right? Is that we're breathing, we pant uh, after heavy exercise because we have to get rid of um, excess carbon dioxide. And we'll learn that carbon dioxide is the gas that drives our breathing. And I just want to rely uh, quickly, uh, review the respiratory equation, which is anytime you have carbon dioxide and water. I have to say, if you're going to stay in healthcare, you absolutely need to know this, this equation. It matters in physiology, it matters in medicine, it matters, pH. Anytime you have CO2 and water, some of it's going to recombine into carbonic acid, and some of that will disassociate into H plus and HCO3 uh, minuses. Right, and remember that pH is the measure of free hydrogens in a solution. And you just have to just know the best way to learn it in healthcare is at any time, whatever's happening to CO2, that's exactly what's happening to hydrogen in this equation. It's all staying in equilibrium. If you add CO2, it's the way I memorized it, right? If you add CO2 this to the system, you're going to have an increase in free hydrogens. If you remove um, CO2, you're going to have a decrease in free hydrogens in this system. All right, a decrease in free hydrogens would be going up on the pH scale. An increase in free hydrogens would mean you're going down on the pH scale. Remember your pH scale running from 0 to 14. And uh, you have the most free hydrogens that you're going to have uh, down at the zero end. And you have the least free hydrogens uh, up at the top end. Right? In fact, at 14, you have no uh, free hydrogens. So just wanted to point that out. And... Uh, Make sure that nobody thinks that we've actually run out of oxygen when we're exercising. All right, so let's keep moving on. So next thing is when we left off last class, uh, I actually had a slide uh, that I had put up, and I wanted to put that back right now because uh, there was a problem. And... Uh, if you guys recall, we had this slide up, and when I was finished with it, I said, there's a fifth way. There's a fifth way that uh, um, the messenger is going to get uh, removed. We were talking about how do we end the message, and I couldn't remember the fifth way, right? So uh, I wanted to uh, go back and address that, right? So here we go, right? How did, can the message be stopped? So remember, quick review uh, from last class. Uh, we showed that the messenger can simply diffuse away, and we'll see some examples of that today. Uh, we saw that we can have enzymatic destruction, and we'll look at that again. We've seen a, how acetylcholinesterase, for example, can destroy acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. Enzymatic modification of the messenger. We haven't seen an example of that yet, but probably we will. Um, reuptake of the messenger, right? That one we saw, and we used an example of the serotonin reuptake inhibitors uh, and how those... Uh, are able to uh, block the reuptake of a messenger. And uh, today we're gonna take a look at, uh, at muscle and we'll see how choline, right, which is gonna be the metabolite, one of the molecules left over after we uh, process acetylcholine, how choline is gonna get reuptake by the presynaptic neuron and allow it to be that portion of acetylcholine to be recycled. All right, so finally, uh, down regulation. Right, so I know if any of you remember, we call the fifth one, and the fifth one, I just couldn't think of it in class, right, is uh, down regulation. And what's going on in down regulation is that the cell is going to remove the messenger uh, and the receptor, right? The whole entire messenger and receptor complex is going to get taken out of the cell membrane, right? The Golgi, under the direction of the nucleus, can add things to the cell membrane, upregulation, and it can remove things from the membrane, down regulation. And it can decide to remove a receptor any time with or without its messenger. And if it removes it with its messenger, as long as there's no receptor in the membrane, right, the message has been stopped. Sorry. Anyways, very important one. So glad I remembered that one. All right, so quick review here. A lot of today's review. 
looking at the motor neuron and making sure we understand it all, right? Hopefully we understand at the proximal end how by uh, summation with excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitter arrive that eventually we're going to reach uh, action potential is going to be reached, right? And when that happens, our wave of polarity, right, is going to enter and diffuse down the axon. And it's going to travel by continuous or by saltatory conduction. And then when it arrives at the terminal end, right, what's it going to happen there? As our wave of positivity arrives, as our depolarization arrives at the distal end, as it enters the synaptic knobs, we're going to have a voltage-sensitive calcium uh, channel that's going to be sitting here and it's going to spring open and it's going to allow calcium to enter and we saw how last class how calcium enters it's going to find its binding site on the synaptic knobs and its binding site is going to be on the snare proteins that are located inside the synaptic knobs so when calcium comes in Right, enters the cell, it's going to bind to its receptors on the snare proteins, and that's going to cause uh, exocytosis. And that'll bring our vesicle to the cell membrane. And now our contents of our vesicle will be our released. Remember, when we do exocytosis, the cell membrane gets a little bigger because now the vesicle has fused with the membrane. But now that's exocytosis. Now our neurotransmitter has traveled across the gap, has been released. And now it needs to travel across the gap and it's gonna do so by a process where it's gonna move from where it's more concentrated over to where it's less concentrated, right? That's just gonna be diffusion. So there's our motor neuron. Remember how the action potential uh, is going to come, it's going to travel down the terminal end of this motor neuron. When it reaches there, it's going to cause calcium to enter. Calcium is going to bind onto its synaptic, uh, bind onto the snare proteins and cause exocytosis. Then the neurotransmitter is free to diffuse across the neuromuscular junction. Right Now we're at the neuromuscular junction. And remember, we looked at motor units. I thought the video um, did a really nice job of actually showing us a, a good description of motor units. Right, but now we've got a motor neuron, it's coming down, it's got its synapse, right, it's coming down and synapsing onto a muscle cell. And remember, we're going to have a receptor here for acetylcholine. And now our vesicle has been released. The neurotransmitter begins diffusing in all directions. It's released by exocytosis, it diffuses in all directions and eventually binds to its receptor. And that is going to cause a sodium channel to open. And you guys know what happens next. Sodium does what it's supposed to do and it enters the cell. And that region right where the messenger arrives is going to begin to depolarize. And since the rest of the cell is still negative in other locations further away, it is still negative with respect to the outside. Right, and that's going to begin causing action potentials to spread in every direction. Right, and that was the difference between a muscle cell and a neuron. Right, it spreads in every direction and it spreads down the T tubules. So, here's a slide once it gets to the T tubules, right, what's going on, and just a little quick review of the sliding filament. So hopefully now you know it comes down that T-tubule and when it gets to the T-tubule it's going to change the shape of the DHP protein and that's going to cause oh, that looks terrible that's going to cause my lateral sacs to be unplugged Right, and it's the arrival of sodium as sodium is traveling and depolarizing and entering the cell membrane. As sodium does that, right, as it crosses in, and this is just sodium, it's doing that because it's voltage sensitive, sodium channels are opening, sodium is just diffusing down its gradient, right, and coming in. And when it does that, that DHP protein is gonna sense it, it's gonna unplug, and when it does that, now that's gonna allow for calcium 
which has been sequestered inside the lateral sacs of the SR. Right, remember, we've got our pump here that's been sequestering it. And that's going to allow this calcium to diffuse out. Right, it's in a high concentration uh, inside the SR, right? It's going to be in low concentration inside the sarcoplasmic, inside the sarcoplasm. Why? Because of the pump, right? It's been spending ATP to concentrate it and make sure that it's low in the plasma, right? So as soon as we unplug it, it can diffuse out and calcium is going to come and it's going to come and it's going to find its binding site on troponin. Right? And when it finds troponin, it's going to bind to troponin. When it binds to troponin, it's going to take that complex that had all of its binding sites available, but those binding sites have been covered up by the tropomyosin. And when here's some troponins, right? When calcium comes and it binds on, make it a brighter color, right? Here comes my calcium, it binds on to troponin. That's going to cause a shape change. Right, because a protein, you can add something to a protein, it changes conformational shape. You can remove something from a protein, it changes conformational shape. We add calcium to troponin, it's going to change the shape of the troponin tropomyosin complex, change shape. And now my comp, my tropomyosin, there you see it, it swivels and changes shape. Right, and now my myosin binding sites are exposed, and so now my myosin that's been sitting here energized with an ADP and a phosphate that had already been broken from the last time, uh, the last muscle contraction before the muscle relaxed, right? That's already there previously bound, right? And now it's, that's giving it energy and that's gonna cause it to wanna reach up, right? And bind to its binding site. Now that protein can only attach to ADP and a phosphate or attach to its binding site on actin. It cannot attach to both. So the moment it prefers its binding site on actin, so the moment it attaches, right, that, that ADP and a phosphate has to disengage, right, they can no longer stay bound. Our DP and ADP and our phosphate, right, they're going to diffuse away. They're going to be heading back to the mitochondrion where they can get recycled and the mitochondrion can turn out more ATP. But meanwhile, as soon as the ADP and a phosphate diffuse away, that's going to cause another shape change, and that's going to create our power stroke. Our power stroke is going to then pull the actin towards the midline of the sarcomere. Then it's going to take another ATP is going to have to come bind onto its binding site. Right, that's going to, when it binds, it can no longer stay attached to actin. It can either bind to ATP or to actin, so then it has to let go of the actin. Our ADP and our phosphate are going to be dephosphorylated, right? And that's going to cause an energy source that's going to cause it to be able to come back up again, right? And be energized again with the ADP and the phosphate ready to go again. And anyways, I'll review that again on the next slide is the cycling of the ATP. Now, what I really want to take a focus in now is this is this binding and bind contract, binding, pull, bind, pull, bind, pull, bind, release, bind, release of the myosin on the actin will continue until we can do something to stop it, right? And so we need to get the filaments to slide apart, right? We've got our sarcomere, here's our Z lines, let's say, and our sarcomere is shortened, right? And we need to get it to slide back apart. Remember, myosin doesn't change shape, it just stays there in the middle, but our sarcomere lengthens right, because it's going from one Z-line to the next, our, our sarcomere lengthens. The only way we can get it to lengthen is we have to get calcium to no longer be bound to troponin. As long as there is calcium bound to troponin, right, as long as there's calcium sitting here bound to troponin, we are going to get a shortening. We are going to get a permanent contraction. A permanent uh, contraction uh, is called tetanus. Right? And so, for example, the botulinum toxin from the botulinum bacterium uh, interferes with the system and causes a permanent muscle contraction. It can lead to uh, paralysis of the diaphragm and suffocation of its victims. All right. Now, in order to get it to lengthen, 
in order to get the muscle to relax, right, we have to have the calcium has to leave this and it has to go back into the SR, right? As long as calcium is present, we're going to get a shortening. We have to get it to leave to get a lengthening. So that's what I wanted to focus on here with this slide. Right? We have to, we're going to have to lower the calcium levels in order to get a relaxation. We have to lower the calcium levels to get a relaxation. And we know that as soon as the calcium levels are low enough, calcium will just simply diffuse away from its complex. And when it diffuses away from its complex, as we saw on the previous slide, right? as soon as it diffuses away from its complex, oh, I can't do that with this system now. As soon as it diffuses away from its complex, right? so... Sorry about that, guys. Right? As soon as the calcium diffuses away from its complex here, I was doing so well. Right? We've got calcium concentration. When it diffuses away from troponin, right, then it won't be bound, right? Then we're going to get the conformational um, change in our troponin tropomycin complex. Right? That's going to recover the binding sites. And once those binding sites are blocked, right, now finally we're gonna get a relaxation. So we gotta just talk about, right, how are we gonna lower the calcium concentration? So remember the calcium concentration is being maintained by active transport, right? The calcium levels in the sarcoplasm are being maintained by active transport. So that pump is always running, whether we're contracting or relaxing. When we unplug the SR, the pump isn't strong enough to counteract the hole, right? So this SR is draining. In order for the pump to get the upper hand and to be able to reconcentrate and refill the SR, we have to replug the SR, right? So we need to get the SR to close. So remember, how do we get the SR to close, right? So to get the SR to close, uh, this is going to have to happen on, we're going to have to have something on the outside of the cell has to happen because right now on the outside of the cell, We've been having acetylcholine bound. As long as acetylcholine is bound, then the cell is going to be positive on the inside. As long as it's positive on the inside, then the DHP protein will be in a shape where it's unplugging the SR. So to get it to replug, right, to get the SR to close, right, to replug it, we have to destroy the acetylcholine. We have to destroy the messenger. Right? So we've evolved the system where our acetylcholinesterase, our enzyme, is sitting right here on the membrane and it's able to immediately come in and destroy acetylcholine. It actually metabolizes the acetylcholine into two new molecules. It, it breaks it down into a choline and an acetyl group. The acetyl group just kind of diffuses away, it's handled by the blood system. That choline, though, is actually going to be taken in by a reuptake pump where it can be Remetabolized back into acetylcholine and recycled and reused. Okay, now the moment that we destroy the acetylcholine, that's the moment that our cell membrane is going to change its polarity, and those sodium channels, potassium channels, will be opening. Cell is going to be repolarizing as the cell, re cell repolarizes on the inside. Right, that's going to cause the inside to change. That's going to lengthen the shape of my DHP protein and that's going to cause it to uh, close the holes in the lateral sac. Now, and we finally get uh, muscle relaxation once the calcium gets reuptake. All right, so let's move on. So I wanted to focus this last little piece on the ATP of muscle contraction, and then I'm just going to see do a review with as much time as we have a remaining. Realizing that you already spent 27 minutes on a uh, video uh, today, this morning, but also class was a little short yesterday, or shall I say Tuesday. So taking a look at where ATP is used in muscle contraction. So remember, we have to maintain the sodium potassium pump because with muscle contraction, we always need to keep our, our gradients for sodium and potassium. If we don't have the gradient, uh, we won't be able to do action potentials. We won't be able to have muscle contraction, 
right? We're going to need our calcium pump, right? Our calcium pump is going to always be concentrating and creating our gradient for calcium so that we have uh, more uh, calcium uh, in the SR. We're also going to be using ATP uh, at the myosin head, and that's the place where people have the most difficulty, and I want to just take the time to focus on that, on the myosin head. So we know the tails are sitting there bound in their core, right, what they call our central core. We just want to focus in on the head. This head is a really complex uh, protein. The whole molecule is a complex protein. But it's an enzyme because it's able to take the molecule ATP and it's able to undergo dephosphorylation where it can do the chemical reaction where it breaks ATP into its ADP in a phosphate. All right, so that makes it an enzyme and it's able to be used over and over and over again. It's not used up by the chemical reaction that it mediates, right? The myosin heads are, are there uh, continuously. And so it's an enzyme, right? And remember that it's got that binding site there for it's able to do that. Now, it also has its other binding site where it's able to bind onto actin, right? That's its binding site on actin. So when a previous muscle contraction has occurred and the muscle begins to relax, um, this thing will have an ADP and a phosphate uh, attached to it. And it's energized, right? It wants to reach up. The ADP and the phosphate is energizing it, giving it the shape to reach up. Uh, but at this point, if tropomyosin is in the way of our myosin binding sites, at, at the myosin head won't be able to get there, right? But that's when it's in its energized state. And it'll be in an energized state at the end of a contraction, right? It's just that... If troponin is not available to bind to, if calcium is not available to bind to troponin, right, it's not there, then my tropomyosin complex swivels, right, and the myosin head can't get there. It wants to get there. It's energized. So as soon as, I apologize for any background noise, you guys, uh, and I will have hopefully a microphone uh, set up soon, but we've got multiple things going on in this uh, location. All right, so now as soon as the binding sites are exposed, right, so now we assume that troponin is here and calcium has come and it's bound onto troponin and that has exposed the binding sites on actin. Right, so now the head is energized and it's going to begin automatically reaching up and going towards its favorite thing to bind to, which is going to be actin. And as it reaches up, it actually even begins to change shape and it'll change its conformation to fit and bind and form a linkage covalent bond there with uh, actin and what they sometimes call a cross bridge. And now here's the moment. It can only either stay bound to ADP and a phosphate or stay bound to actin, but it cannot stay bound to both. So the moment that it reaches up and attaches, changes shape and attaches itself to actin, that's the moment where the ADP and the phosphate cannot no longer stay attached because it can't bind both, it can only bind one or the other, right? And so that's the moment where my ADP and my phosphate diffuse away and the diffusing away of it is going to cause another shape change. And that's going to cause the power stroke. And that power stroke is what's actually going to drag and pull the actin, slide the actin towards the midline. Right? If this was my sarcomere, and pull it towards the midline of the sarcomere. Now, once it's done its power stroke and it's pulled, now it's going to stay bound. This is, this is a covalent bond here. It's going to stay bound here. We have to give it a reason to let go. And the only thing that it likes better than actin is ATP. So luckily for this thing, right, there's a steady supply of ATP in the cell. So ATP and a binding site that's exposed, right? So ATP is going to come and it's going to bind to its binding site. When it binds onto its binding site, at that exact moment it binds to its binding site, the molecular head here, it can no longer, the myosin head can no longer stay bound to both, right? So it disengages, right? It still wants to attract, um, but it disengages, 
but now it kind of like flops down because it's no longer energized and the energy energy is going to come from the dephosphorylation again and now i'm going to undergo my chemical reaction right where i'm going to do adp is going to be split into adp and a phosphate right that's going to release energy that energy is going to energize it and allow it to come back up and cycle over and over and over and over again but remember the reason it's energized is because there's always a previously bound adp and phosphate from the last time there was a contraction just prior to a relaxation all right here what I wanted to do was I was taking a look at our study guide and I just wanted to do a quick little review where I can of the material here from the study guide. And so complete the table by listing the three types of muscle cells and state where they are located and whether they are voluntary or involuntary. And gosh, I think you guys can do this. If you did do this, maybe you did it with Ann, I don't know. But hopefully you guys know they're from anatomy, they're smooth muscle, right? single centrally located nucleus, does not have striations. That doesn't mean it doesn't have actin and myosin, right? Striations are just a particular arrangement of the actin and myosin, right? So that under the microscope, we'll get the appearance of the light and dark uh, of uh, uh, actin and myosin, right? But all cells have actin and myosin, even the unstriated um, smooth muscle still has actin and myosin. They're just not arranged in the highly ordered uh, sarcomere. Okay, into the striations, right? S location of smooth muscle, it's going to be on any... Uh, you're going to see it on any tube... Any hollow organ that's not the heart, right, will have smooth muscle. That's a blood vessel, that's ducts, tear ducts, that's bronchial tubes, digestive tubes, right? Any type of tube is going to have a small uh, smooth muscle, right? And hopefully you guys know that it's involuntary. Otherwise, you'd be able to contract your intestine at will. Okay, uh, the next type of uh, muscle we're going to look at, right? is cardiac and we'll take a good look at that after break and uh, as we begin to look at blood pressure and obviously it's located in the heart it's the only place we find it that's why it's called cardiac it's supposed to be heart and that also would be uh involuntary right involuntary involuntary right you cannot you can influence your heart uh you can uh You can get your heart to, uh, you can relax yourself and you can get your heart to sort of gently, you know, maybe increase or speed up the influence of it, but it's always under involuntary control, right? You can't just start it and stop it at will, right? And then the only one that's under voluntary control would be our skeletal muscle, right? And that's attached to mostly our bones, right? And that's the one that's under voluntary control. And when we're sleeping at night, it could be under involuntary control as needed. And um, of these three, one other thing we would say is the striations, right? That cardiac and uh, skeletal both have striations, right? Which means they have that particular arrangement of actinomycin, whereas smooth, hence its name, correct, does not. Okay. Yeah. I also want to take a look at the next question. Draw a diagram of the arrangement of the thick and thin filaments in a striated muscle. Right, I'm not going to have you do that on, a, on an exam, uh, take home or otherwise, but you really do have to understand how a sarcomere looks uh, in order to uh, begin to understand how it's coming together and forming the contraction. So I highly recommend you do that. Right, a uh, motor unit, very important concept. Uh, right, one motor neuron. In all the muscle fibers, right, another word for cell, all the muscle fibers that it innervates, that it goes to, right, a neuromuscular junction is one is a neuron where that neuron meets a muscle cell, that would be a neuromuscular junction, and draw, draw and label a neuromuscular junction, uh, I don't know, here's a synapse, here's a muscle cell. 
Be sure to include the cleft, the sarcolemma, the synaptic bulb, and uh, the receptor for acetylcholine. I don't know. Hopefully you guys know that. It's still it's anatomy, but still you gotta review stuff to make sure you know your physiology. Um, what are what is a neurotransmitter, right? Neurotransmitters are proteins. They are proteins that are uh, paracrine messengers that are able to go from one either from one neuron to another neuron. They can go from a neuron to a muscle cell, and sometimes they can go to a neuron to a gland. For example, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system can directly stimulate glands uh, like the adrenal gland or suprarenal gland for it to make uh, epinephrine or adrenaline, right? So that's what a neurotransmitter is. Uh, what neuro? What does a neurotransmitter use at the neuromuscular junction? It's always the same. Um, it's always acetylcholine. And that is a difference between uh, a neuro, neuro junction versus a neuromuscular junction. The neuromuscular junction is always excitatory. There is no such thing as an inhibitory one because it's always acetylcholine. Uh, what are the three functions of ATP in skeletal muscle? We've taken a look at that. Maintaining our concentration of sodium potassium, maintaining our concentration of calcium, and maintaining our uh, cycling of our myosin head to maintain a contraction. And hopefully you can do the sliding filament theory. Here's a thought one to look up, effect of botulinum toxin. Uh, our textbook has a lot of good examples for it. It does the botulinum toxin and a few others. It does some nice examples. And I was going to end uh, by taking, this was actually a handout that I made for a Bio 190 class originally. They are like a baby AMP. And uh, you guys know it at much greater detail, but I thought maybe we could end by trying to fill in this together. And again, you can pause the video, uh, fill it in yourself. And then uh, this is from our study guide, uh, from the companion guide, the study guide portion. Right? And so this is uh, taking a look at muscle contraction. And trying to see if you could just, if you can't fill in the blanks yet, you don't know it. You want to make it your, your own. You want to be able to explain it in your own words even. But maybe uh, you can try by just filling this in. All right, so here we go. So we've got muscle contraction. Muscle contraction is initiated by the arrival of an action potential as it comes traveling down the terminal end of a blank neuron. And hopefully you guys know. That is a motor neuron. Now, in order to get this to fit the one page here, I had to really squeeze it in. I apologize. But again, this is in your study guide, so if you can't read it, you can read it in your study guide. A neurotransmitter, right, called acetylcholine is released from storage. What are the containers called? Vesicles, right? Those are in our synaptic knob. And that is the process of exocytosis. Uh, the neurotransmitter travels across the synapse by diffusion. I'm not sure what I meant to put there. But, you know, this neurotransmitter then travels across the synapse by diffusion and binds to the cell membrane receptor on the sarcolemma. The binding of the neurotransmitter causes an action potential. Here we go. The binding, a new, new uh, signal transduction. The binding of the neurotransmitter causes an action potential to be generated across the entire sac or lemma in all directions. It spreads down the T tubules uh, of the sarcoplasmic reticulum down the T tubules. This causes the DHP protein complex to change its conformation, opening up the calcium channels in the lateral sacs of the SR. The SR will release calcium uh, ions into the sarcoplasm of the muscle cell by the process of diffusion. Right? They've been concentrated by the process of active transport. Right? That took ATP. Their release is just by diffusion, passive mechanism, no ATP. Right? Those Ions then flood the sarcoplasm, they diffuse down their gradient, and they're going to bind to the uh, troponin molecule, which will be located uh, 
bind to the troponin molecule, right, which is attached to the tropomyosin. The binding of this ion causes the exposure of the myosin binding sites on the actin filament. Next, the heads, the myosin heads begin to, I don't know, for some reason I feel the need to switch colors here because it's like a new action. All right now, right, first we got to get our acetylcholine, that was one color, right, then that gonna releases uh, calcium, that was another color, that travels to troponin, that's another effect, gets the myosin, now we're going to get the myosin heads, we're going to begin to bind, pull, contract, uh, release, uh, pulling the actin filaments uh, with it, right, and the release of these heads is assisted by ATP, you guys know that in a lot more detail, but my 190 students, I was happy they just knew that it was assisted by ATP, Right, without this molecule, the head would be unable to release. The attached pull release continues as long as the neurotransmitter is bound to the cell membrane receptor. To end the process, we're going to need another molecule, right? Our acetylcholine esterase. Is going to destroy the neurotransmitter. This causes the pump within the SR to uh, re- concentrate, repump, I'm not sure what I had for choices up above, uh, reconcentrate the ions uh, from the sarcoplasm. The ion is no longer bound to troponin, right? So now it's no longer bound to troponin, and that is going to cause the tropomyosin complex. That's going to cause the troponin tropomyosin complex to change shape, right? To swivel, to change shape, whatever word you want to put there, right? That's going to cause, write that word again, swivel, right? To change shape. That's going to recover the uh, myosin binding sites on actin. And the thick filaments, myosin, Right, if its binding sites are covered, it can no longer bind to the thin filaments or actin, and that is going to cause our sarcomere to release, and finally we get a lengthening of our sarcomere. Right, so there you have it. Uh, I think that's kind of the end. Uh, I'm sure some of you may have some questions for me. I'm still figuring out what I'm going to do for you guys, and talking to my dean and my chair on how to get you deliver exams for you guys and have you do some sort of take-home exam, and I'll have more information about that tomorrow. And no, you don't have to take and complete an exam in tomorrow's class time. Uh, I'll either give it to you at the end of break or I'll give it to you tomorrow to use during break. I want to remind everybody to make sure that they sign in uh, to class, answer my questions about Wi-Fi, answer my questions about uh, things like that, and uh, so make sure that you do attendance. And tomorrow, hopefully uh, at lab time, <laughs> I don't think I'll have it ready at 8. Uh, let's try 10, 10 a.m., seeing as we're working from home. Uh, basically, you're just going to keep looking on uh, for announcement from Canvas. And uh, that's it. I hope you guys uh, have a good evening. And uh, remember, there's uh, some uh, Zoom, confer Zoom going on with uh, Ann over in uh, PSP. And I put an announcement up with links to how to get to there. And uh, stay safe. Only go out. Don't travel for food, for work, or for your health to go to the hospital. Otherwise, stay home, guys. Let's try to flatten the curve.